<laughs> okay, so um, at the end of the previous lecture, I promised some kind of. Uh, uh, so the uh, third lecture is simply done. I promised some kind of heuristics about this conjecture. Uh, so let's see. Uh, so this is a heuristic I learned from the PhD thesis of Michael Tayoka. As you will see, so it's kind of rough heuristic, so that's up to you if you are convincing or not, but it's, uh, I think it's nice. So we would like to, want to see why, why this uh, equation has a different behavior according to the, to the sign of the determinant of age. Okay, so this equation. Oh. Okay, so instead of looking at this equation, let's look at a kind of caricature of this equation. So the caricature is the following. So suppose you start, suppose you start from some uh, profile which is just flat. And then, okay, uh, first, of all, first of all, in, in, the, in, this, in this caricature, actually, the abduction will be just a lot. <laughs> okay, but anyway. So the caricature is the following. If the, if the noise, what it does is uh, to, it's, uh, you know, even if you start from a flat profile, uh, it introduces some bumps. So let's, let's look at the following. Suppose the effect of the noise is to introduce some bumps in the, in the profile. Uh, just like, let's just look at a single bump. And then, suppose, uh, so the, the noise intervenes, if, uh, creates this, okay. if there were no noise, then uh, the solution would just be H equal to. Uh, the noise arrives, creates a bump, then the noise for some time is not, uh, is not uh, acting. And only this nonlinear part uh, is acting on this bump, so it's making this bump evolve. Okay, and let's let's see what happens. And then, of course, uh, some time later, some other bump will appear, and they will accumulate. All right. So, so now we, we know how to solve the, this, uh, this equation. Well, uh, what happens is that uh, okay. So here there is a say there is a const. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, let, let's look at the one-dimensional situation. So where d t once the once the bump has appeared, it just about as the x h squared. Okay, because the the noise has acted, but then for some time it's not acted. Okay, so what happens here is that uh, suppose this bump is sort of parabolic, has a parabolic shape around its maximum, and uh, then uh, you have dth equal uh, this thing squared. So at the maximum the derivative is zero, so this bump is not increasing in height. But uh, here the derivative is not, uh, is not zero, so it's actually growing. So what you can see is that as time evolves, this parabolic bump near the maximum, so that the height stays the same and it's getting actually larger because it's, uh, it's growing. And the curvature here, say c of t, is going to zero as like 1 over t, t large. Okay, so the bump is getting larger and larger. So, so, but suppose that, okay, this is one situation. So this bump is, is gone. Uh, but uh, another thing might happen is that the noise creates a negative bump. Uh, also, also with, with the we see as par the parabolic, essentially, at the minimum. And uh, the situation here is different, because again, at the, at the minimum, the derivative is zero, it's not growing, <coughs> but here now it's growing. So actually, this thing, at some point, the following happens. Starting from some point on, at the minimum, at the minimum you, you actually create a cusp. And then you can see that the height of this uh, bump is actually decreasing in time as 1 over square root of t. You have to do a little... Uh, essentially, these two parts of the curve are, are also parabola. It's a, it's a simple computation. Okay, so the positive and negative bumps be behave very asymmetrically. This will spread, the positive one will spread, and the negative one will, uh, will actually shrink, the, the height will, will go to zero. Of course, if I had chosen here a minus sign in front, it would be reversed. reversed. Oh. Uh, now, now, let's go to 2D. Uh, same thing, it's except that uh, suppose that uh, I want to compare two situations. The case where H is the identity, which is uh, the easiest, so it's kind of like in the, the KPZ, uh, Class, or the case where h is is one minus one t which is the kind of the opposite case where the determinant is negative. 
Okay, so here essentially it's the same. So in the sense that if you, once you create this bump that now is kind of paraboloid in two dimensions, both if you look it in the x direction or in the y direction, you have the same behavior. So the positive bump will spread, the negative bump will create cusp and difference. Okay, so in the, here you don't see so, so much different. But now when you go here in, uh, in, the, in this anisotropic case, what you can see is the following: that uh, uh, suppose you are, your h is one minus one, then if, if you if you take a take a kind of projection in the x direction, you will see the situation: the positive bumps decreasing. But if you look at the in the in the in the, in the perpendicular direction, so like here, and I look at uh, okay, uh, at the y-axis, this this parabolic bump. Since now I have a minus sign in the luminarity, actually we start to decrease. Okay, so the point is that since uh, in the two directions the, the behavior is, is, is the, the sign is opposite, this, if you think of it for a moment, it means that when the equation is like this, and you, you let the, the bump evolve according to the equation, both positive and negative bump will, will actually shrink, because in one of the two directions you see this effect of shrinking. Okay, you have to. Okay, I can the question I, uh, I can explain, but the, 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 the basic thing is that when you create these local bumps, thanks to the opposite signs of these two numbers, both positive and negative bumps tend to decrease with time. So you can imagine that uh, when more, more and more bumps arrive, somehow they have time to relax, they don't accumulate too much. Why in the case where the, both things have the positive sign, then the positive bumps will tend to don't, don't disappear, so they accumulate more and they create, create more roughness as time goes. Okay, so yeah, I think it's, it gives an idea of why, the, of why the sign of the determinant has a role. Now, as I said, it's convincing up to, I mean, yeah, up to a certain point. But, uh, but at least you get, yeah. But also in the positive bump, it goes down, no? So in, in this case here, no, in the other case, case there are one of the two bumps that disappears, but uh, let's say one every second bump will be negative. So <laughs> uh, these negative ones really don't uh, don't disappear. So you should think, okay, you should think uh, that in the case I uh, sorry H equal one one, what happens is that you have this. Uh, okay, unfortunately you have to. Okay, let's try to make a two-dimensional picture. When you create a positive bump. This will start spreading and not, not uh, be flattened, and the negative ones will disappear quickly. Say. But the positive one start to accumulate, so you will produce a lot of roughness. While in the case minus one minus one, both the positive and the negative tend to disappear quite rather quickly. So certainly this is a difference between the two. Uh, are you, you okay? It's a physics after that. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no I mean, yeah, yeah, once you have this parabola, you can, you can study the dilution once you forget the noise and the Laplace. Okay, so by knowing the decay is like 1 over t and the 1 over square t. No, okay, no, it's, a, it's a bit rough. So, but no, the point is, no, but okay, 1 over t is the, is the curvature. So it's, it's, since it's decreasing, yeah, it's actually, this, this, this thing is, yeah, it's the curvature. Okay. No, 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 the height here remains the same. That does not decrease. No, no, I'm not comparing uh, powers. In this case, it does not decrease, and it gets larger. And in this case, <laughs> it's actually shrinking in height. But by knowing this, like, uh, one of the square root of t and the one of the t, can you conclude anything about the exponents? Or? They're not rational. Huh? No, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I just, no, no. That, that's as much as, as far as it goes. This, this. But uh, at least it shows you why, it shows that it, it might really make a difference, the sign of this, uh, this the But as I said, I mean, it's, uh, <coughs> also we forgot the Laplace, so I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it gives an idea of why it is so linearity. <laughs> Uh, uh, Excuse me, but it has to be more rough in the case of 2D. <coughs> so in the case where the, the mm, thing is 1, 1, we expect the roughness to go in time like a power of time. 
e to the, what was it, 0 0.24. And in the case of uh, h equal 1 minus 1, the, the fluctuation are, should be growing time much slower, like the value. Because there is killing uh, uh, in some part. Uh, yeah, this, this is, is, this is another, it's another way of seeing. It's killing, so it became more, more rough. Uh, okay, you can imagine that there is also an effect of uh, cancellations between uh, the two parts in the nonlinearity. This is the problem because if there is cancellations, you, you would get uh, more uh, smooth. Yeah, in fact, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is what happens. And you have dimension two, it has to be more rough than dimension one. No, but here I'm not comparing dimension one with dimension two. Uh, That's only an idea of comparison. I'm just, I, rather comparing, always stay in dimension 2, I would like to compare the two situations according to the structure of the matrix. So I'm not comparing the different dimensions. Okay, so anyway, so if you don't like the argument, uh, you, are, you, are, you have a right to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so this was the last slide uh, of the first lecture. And, um, Okay, so let me go on. Uh, let me come back to the to this uh, to the only uh, growth process I introduced up to now. Let me recall: you have uh, uh, it's a process uh, whose uh, height functions are of the of this type here. If you want this kind of uh, step uh, to dimensional interfaces and the and the the the, 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 the <coughs> The, the, mm, the growth process is simply each of these particles tries to jump up by one, but it has to be allowed by the neighboring particles. And say, say we are looking at the totally asymmetric situation where they can just go up, up and never go down. For okay. So, uh, yes. Okay, how, how does this uh, model fit in this picture of uh, KPZ or an anisotropic KPZ class? Well, this process, at least in the totally asymmetric situation, has a special property called the envelope property. That is, if you take two high profiles, H is a, is a, is a high profile, so it's an integer value, high function, etc. And you take two of them, and you take the minimum. It's like if you were in one dimension, you have, you have for instance, this high profile, this other high profile, and the minimum <coughs> would just be uh, the red one. Okay. So suppose you take two profiles and take the minimum. And then you, the envelope property says that the evolution start, you can couple the two uh, dynamics, started from one profile or the other, in such a way that, actually you can couple three dynamics. You have the dynamics started from profile one, the dynamics started from profile two, and the dynamics started from the minimum of the two. You can couple the three so that the dynamics started from the minimum is at, at every time the minimum of the two profiles. Okay, I managed to say. Okay. So it's something you can you can check. It's not hard to check for this dynamic. It's not a general, uh, not a general property. Of the, for instance, I think if you already if you look, uh, allow partially asymmetry, partial asymmetry uh, jump up and down, uh, that's already fails. But in the total asymmetric case, this is true. And uh, once you have this property, there is a very nice and after a rather simple subadditivity argument. I think it appeared first in the, in the work works by Sapenheimer that was also used later in the works by Reza Kanlu, that implies that, for instance, the speed of, speed of growth P, uh, P of rho actually exists, and it's concave. Okay? It's, a, it's an argument based on superadditivity. Essentially, you use, use King, uh, Kingman's uh, but the ergodic theorem. It doesn't tell you what the speed is, but it tells you that the speed exists and is concave. Okay, so, very well. And so, uh, yes. Um, okay. Uh, so now we, we have this that this V uh, is concave. So suppose, which is not proven, suppose that it's also stri strictly concave and that it's uh, Hessian. So it's Hessian. Uh, okay, the Hessian of V could not might not exist. The V could have a cusp at the same level. But suppose V is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a smooth. And uh, has a non the, the, the Hessian function has non zero, non -zero eigenvalues. In this case, they both have the same sign. Because I think they are both named. Because it's concave. So in this case, this, uh, supposing that uh, 
that uh, V is uh, strictly concave and uh, has non-zero eigenvalue uh, for the Hessian, then this model is clearly in the, a candidate to belong to, this, the, to the second universal <coughs> class. Because if you have two, non, two negative eigenvalues, then the determinant of this stuff will be negative. Okay? So clearly, this model here is a candidate to belong to this uh, KPZ universality class. But uh, and in fact, uh, uh, numerics has been done to, to compute this critical uh, the, um, roughness and growth exponents that have been computed numerically. They, they give these numbers that they give here. And there are much more is known numerically. Like there are certain uh, limit non Gaussian laws for the fluctuations and so on. But this is essentially. This is all numeric. And uh, the only thing you can prove uh, mathematically is uh, the existence of this speed and also a hydrodynamic limit. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll have it later. But it's not, is it explicit? No, no, no. no this is very Otherwise, you would know it. No, no, no. no. This uh, exists. Uh, it's concave. No, I think, uh, I'm not even sure it's, it's known that. There are parts where it is completely complex. So. If you do the same thing for Tazek, of course, V is just all times 1 minus 4. But uh, here, uh, no, I think, as far as I know, it, I'm sorry, it's not, it's not normal. And it really uses this special envelope, <coughs> so-called envelope property. Uh, as soon as you put three state P equal 1 minus epsilon and Q equal the epsilon, uh, that is that fades, and then I, I think it's not even proven that there is a high dynamic limit. Okay, so uh, this is a candidate for this KPZ universality class. Unfortunately, I cannot say anything that is on, not already known here. So, but uh, the, in the rest of the lectures, I will actually present models which belong to the second universality class, the, the one of the linear equation. So the goal of this lecture probably is to uh, present two of the two such models. They are discrete models. The, the first one resembles a bit this one, but it has a crucial difference that will appear later. OK, so, uh, yeah, so here I come now two examples of this anisotropic KPC cross model. The first one is as follows. Um, it, uh, it's, a, it's a growth process that was uh, originally uh, defined by Alexei Bordin and Patrick Ferrari in a paper that, okay, the original paper is from 08 and it was published a bit later. And uh, it works as follows. This is not the way they presented it, but it's, it's an equivalent way to, to see it. So which, uh, somehow it's a representation that I need. looks more convenient, <coughs> or, 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 or convenient to me, but uh, it's equivalent. Again, you have to imagine you have a, an infinite number of particles in the plane. Uh, each one is living on a, on a, on a one-dimensional uh, line that is actually discrete, so the positions are, are, are integers. And from one line to the other, you have these interlacings. Okay, so here I'm just drawing a single particle, a purple one, together with the four neighbors, two from the column on the left, two from the column on the right, that, in, that sort of... Uh, Mm, constrain it in a certain way. Okay. Then, then there are all the others. I've just drawn it. Okay. okay, and the dynamics is the following. It's a kind of formal definition. If you start thinking of it, it's not clear that the process is well defined. But okay, let's, let's define it uh, naively. Uh, you see, this purple uh, part, if the other, if the four neighbors are, are, are fixed for a moment, this purple particle has only a finite number of positions it can take because it, they have to be between uh, above it, it has to be slower, uh, lower than the minimum of these two guys and below it has to be larger than the maximum of these two. so there is a, number of, a finite number of positions it can take and the rule is that for any, for any available position for the purple particle let's say different from the one where the rate of jump to that new position is p if, it, if the position is, up, is above, so if it's a uh, jump upward, and 1 minus p if it is the jump downward. So here, for instance, in this case, there is no possible jump downward. Sir, but it chooses uniformly? No, no, no. Uh, the to if you want, the total rate is, say, suppose you just look at up jumps, the total rate is p times the number of possibilities. So 
Either you say you, you, you take a Poisson clock of, of rate p times the number of possibilities and then you choose randomly, or you have a rate one for each of these. Actually, this is the reason why it's a bit delicate to really define properly the process, because you can imagine situations if you have a lot of space, particles move extremely quickly. So actually, one can cook up. Uh, it's not hard to, to find uh, usual conditions such that particles go to infinity in finite time. And essentially, what okay, this anyway, we not enter this kind of thing. But what uh, what one can see is that the condition for the dynamics to be well defined is the following: that if you look at one column. If you look at one column and you look at the particles along this column uh, in, uh, in the initial state, then uh, if this is particle, say, let me call it number one, two, n, if the distance, if the distance between particle one and n grows uh, super, uh, I think, if the it is much larger than uh, the square. So I mean, the, the, if there are equal spaces, this, this, this uh, spacing is, is essentially linear in n. But if it, you can imagine situations where this spacing grows more than n, n squared, actually. In this case, it's uh, essentially the particles go to infinity. Okay. So you, you can find the situations where the thing is not well. So this is dynamics for anything, or just for people one? Uh, you can define it for, for the, 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 the original paper here is, it is in the totally asymmetric case because equal one. Yeah, yeah, equal one because there are special cases in the special things, uh, special determinant representation for uh, for space time fluctuation in that case. But uh, for the things that we present, it doesn't matter. A little bit uh, the previous one. The, the only difference is that it, instead of being able to jump only by one plus, plus one plus one minus one, you, you are allowed to jump by anything above and below if allowed. So I don't know what would be your guess, but a priori it's not clear whether this growth process should be in the same class as the previous one, but it turns out it is not. So if the, the previous growth process, uh, as I said, is a candidate for the KPZ universality class, it has a convex concave V. This one turns out to be a representative of the second universality class. We will see that the speed, the speed of growth is, is not concave. But, but the only difference is that in the first one, the jumps are only of size yeah. one, right? And so the only thing you change here is that the jumps. Yeah, so, so a priori it's not obvious. Mm -hmm. So I will say in a moment what, what really changes. You might imagine, you might ask what happens if I allow jumps at, at most two or three. So this is very special choice, but there are reasons. So it's kind of, you know, in this growth process, sometimes you have uh, some processes which have uh, special properties like integrability in some sense, and they are sort of isolated points in the space of all possible processes and, uh, you can imagine. So this is a very special choice. I'm not allowed to perturb a little bit uh, the, the jump rates, uh, otherwise things will, uh, will not work. But it's not the, the, the it's a density of the particle of particles at the beginning that <coughs> influence the behavior. So because I was imagining a situation in which essentially you really have only well, you your initial configuration is such that the particles can jump only by one at the beginning. And so essentially the two at that point, like at least at the at the very beginning, the two processes are really the same, but then I mean is yeah, this simply uh, left? I mean did this like it, well, the session in the same yeah the I mean, it's true that as soon as one of the particles moves, I'm out again, so the two are different. But no, you are... Uh, well, in the stationary states, the, the space in between two particles is something like has a kind of uh, exponential distribution. So, okay, so, right, so at some point, anyway, you will start, start having more space, and then we right. uh, really make the... <coughs> Okay, so this is one example. L let me show the second example. It's called the shuffling algorithm. It's uh, something that is 
well known to people who work on dimer models, but uh, maybe this is not uh, the case in this audience, so let me <coughs> explain. Uh, it's a very, I think, I find it a very cute uh, growth model. Uh, so in this slide, I would like to define just the, the um, sort of the set, the, um, the state space of, the, of this dynamic. So I would like to, to, to define the, 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 the allowed uh, height function. Okay, so in this picture you see Z2. And on Z2, uh, first of all, I, I color um, vertices black and white because it's, it's bipartite. I color them, color it in the alternate. <laughs> okay. Well, and then I also draw a perfect matching of Z2. Okay, you should imagine it continues uh, to the whole of Z2, so it's a perfect matching. And then there are numbers associated with the faces. And what I'm saying is that if you have a perfect matching of Z2, also known as a fully packed dimer configuration of Z2, it's a perfect matching. you can associate a height function on the faces in a, in a, in a kind of canonical way. And the thing works as follows. Uh, you have to fix the height somewhere. So, I mean, it's like in the, in the zigzag uh, pass to pa particle picture. Uh, I showed the correspondence in the first lecture, but you have to fix the zero somewhere. Okay, so suppose we fix the zero here. And then the rule is as follows. Okay, so in this choice, uh, for some reason, the, the um, height function is not integer valid, it's just multiples of one quarter, but this doesn't matter. You could multiply every one by four. By four. And the rule is that uh, when you go around a white vertex uh, clockwise, uh, clockwise, the height always increases by one quarter, tuck, tuck, except when you cross the dimer, in which case it drops by three quarters. And then when you do the same thing at the uh, black vertices, it's the same rule except you have to go anti-clockwise. Okay, so you, you can check uh, locally this rule is satisfied. What is maybe not trivial is that uh, this defines this local rule actually defines a, a, a global a global fun, a global uh, high function. Uh, and the reason behind the fact that this local rule uh, defines a global height function is that if you if you associate to the, if you define a flow on the edges, so it's a function defined on the edge that is anti-symmetric, and that gives flow one from white to black when there is a dimer and so and, and, and zero otherwise, this flow has a, has a divergence which is actually independent of the tiling of the of the chosen configuration. It has a divergence which is plus one at white vertices is minus one at black vertices. Okay, but okay. The, the important point to do to make is that uh, you, you can convince yourself in, uh, with pictures or write uh, one, one line proof that this local rule actually uh, defines a uh, well-defined height function. And there is actually a different uh, a way of defining the side function that maybe you would like to make. Is the following? Another way equivalent of defining this height function is the following: is to say that. Uh, when you move from one phase to the other, say this is phase f and this is phase f prime, the height difference from f to f prime, so h of f prime minus h of f, is, okay, let me remember, it is um, one quarter times, uh, no, yes, uh, no, it is, okay, there is something, so let, call, let e denote the edge that you are crossing. There's a sigma of e that I will, uh, will uh, tell you in a second what it is, times the indicator function that e contains a dimer, let's say e contains, it is belonging to the matching, so there is a dimer here or not, minus one quarter, where sigma e doesn't depend on the configuration. It's something that <coughs> sigma e is one if uh, when you cross e, you have the white vertex on the right. Okay, this is white in my convention and uh, minus one if you have the white vertex on the left. Okay, so it's really local. You, you cross an edge, you look whether you are crossing, in which way you are crossing, it's say positively or negatively, and then you check whether there is a dimer or not, and this, this rule is equivalent to, to that one. Okay. All right, so the, the message here, given a perfect matching of Z2, 
there is a well-defined type function that uh, is essentially integer valid apart from this one quarter that I keep simply for uniformity of notation with all the literature, almost one. Uh, okay. So this is the state space. Uh, our dynamics will 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 uh, sort of uh, move around this uh, this dimer, uh, which. So you, you can either see that the, I'm going to, in, to define the dynamics in the next slide. This shuffling algorithm. It's uh, you can either see it as moving around these dimers or uh, as uh, moving the, the height. Okay. Any question? All right, so how does this uh, shuffling algorithm work? It's a, it's a, it's a, okay, it's a, it's a, it's a classic process that was defined uh, some like 30 years ago by Elkis, Cooper, Barry, Larson, and Pot. It has uh, some, some combinatorial, uh, very nice feature, but I will not enter this uh, in this lecture. Okay, so here this slide explains what, what this algorithm uh, does locally. Uh, let me uh, anticipate that this, this uh, algorithm actually proceeds in, it's a discrete time algorithm. So you will do something at step one, then you will do something else at step two, and so on. Okay. And, uh, and actually at each step you will do a lot of stuff in your infinite graphs. But I, I would like to explain what, what, what you do locally. So suppose I want to define one step of the algorithm. <laughs> And uh, the elementary moves, the elementary updates that are um, that are allowed are the, are the following. So first of all, note that uh, uh, at each step of at each step of the algorithm, you will only do something at the faces where usually we call even faces, the faces where which have bottom uh, left uh, vertex of white color. Okay, suppose I, I have my initial uh, dynamic configuration everywhere. I want to, to, to act with the first step of the dynamics. And, uh, okay, let's look at one of these phases. And the first rule is that if at this phase you see two dimers, which necessarily are parallel, because they cannot intersect, then you simply delete them. You just disappear. Deterministic. So there is no randomness in this step here. Okay, this is what the, what the algorithm does locally at that phase. And remark that uh, this is, may seem like a silly thing, but uh, 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 during the algorithm we also change every time the colors of the vertices. The reason is simply that next time we will act on the phases again that have a, mm, so, uh, it's nothing deep, but uh, <coughs> you have your graph saying that this is white, white, black, black. So at the first step you will do something here. At the next step we have swapped the colors so now it's white, white, black, black. So in the, so in the first, uh, in the first uh, step, we do something in this space here, in this space here, etc., on the even faces. And so the second step, we want to do things at the opposite faces. Otherwise, nothing interesting would happen. And one way to encode it is just to say that we swap the colors and we always act on the faces which are even. So just, just a bit. Otherwise, I could do, uh, yeah, I mean, it's the same. All right, so this is the first rule. If you have two parallel dimensions, they could be both horizontal. They, they are also a linear. Now, if instead you see, you see a single one, uh, this can happen because maybe this vertex here is matched to its left and this guy here is matched to below. So this can happen locally. Then again, you do something totally deterministic. You simply you move this guy to the opposite uh, edge. And if it was on the left, you move it right and so on. So this is also a deterministic rule. There is no randomness here. Okay. And the, la the last uh, thing that can happen at the phase is that you see no, no, no dimer because everyone is matched outside. And in this case, there is randomness. You, you, you create, so to speak, two parallel dimers, uh, vertical or horizontal, with probabilities one half, one half, independently of whatever has happened up until then. <coughs> So in one step of the dynamics, what you do is you look at all the even faces and you do this one of these three operations. And if you do it this creation thing, you do it I okay. So in one step of the dynamics, you, you, you do a lot of uh, infinite number of moves. Okay. One thing that maybe is not so obvious is that after you've done this operation, you still have a perfect match. 
this might not look obvious because, for instance, here you are, you are destroying uh, two diamonds, but uh, in the end you want everyone to be matched somewhere. So, but uh, you can convince yourself locally that uh, that these things are still uh, uh, that after the, the update you still have an allowed configuration. For instance, let me simply make one example. Uh, Suppose uh, initially I have <coughs> these two things here. Okay, so after the update, these two disappear. So it doesn't look so good because these things are now unmatched. But then look at this face here. Either it had no dimer earlier, and then you create, for instance, these two, and then uh, <coughs> this one is now matched. Or the other thing that would happen is that, so initially there were these two guys here. If there was a diamond, then it was either here or there. And then in this case, it just slides, and in the end, it will, uh, will cover this vertex. Okay, so, so you, can, you can do pictures. There are a finite number of cases to be checked. Uh, there are more elegant ways to do it, but uh, the thing is that uh, after, you, well, uh, after you have uh, performed this in this parallel, the, this operation in parallel, independent on each event phase, the new configuration is again, again a perfect match. So we, we, don't, we do not uh, exit our state space. It's, it's nice. And so uh, then you can repeat. Uh, you, have, uh, you start from eta 0, eta 1, eta 2. And if you have the discrete time uh, Markov chain on matchings of Z2, of perfect matchings. OK, is the, is the defini definition clear? Well, uh, I would say maybe later, maybe tomorrow, where these dynamics came from. It can, can look a bit uh, weird, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really very, very, some very nice features. Anyway, we can, uh, we, our, our point of view is not, so, okay, so let me say, it. The, the original motivation of these people here was that if you, this dynamics <coughs> for certain initial condition is such that at step n generates exactly a uniform measure on uh, perfect matching of a certain domain of n by a certain n of n domain, n times n domain, which is called the Aztec diamond. So it's a way of perfectly match, perfectly sampling a certain distribution. So in this sense, it's not it has a, it has very much trivial features. But we, we don't want to look at it in this from this point of view. We want to rather to look at it as a, as a growth process. So we say that given a perfect matching, we have a height function. And now this height function depends on the time index n that is discrete. So we have a randomly evolving uh, height function, height, height profile h. Dot, dot is the, the space, is the faces, and n is the time. And uh, well, the rules are given just simply, uh, I mean, uh, determine unambiguously what the height function, how the height function evolves. So let me simply make an example. So here I'm not giving new rules. I'm just translating the rules of the dynamics in terms of height. Suppose at, step, at some let's say, at time zero, you, you are in such a situation, you have two parallel dimers, and then some h here in the middle. The four, eight, the four heights in the, in the, in the boundary are uh, perfectly determined once h is given, but I didn't write them down. Then when you do the delete, delete when you, do, you delete these two guys, what will happen here, you can check, is simply that the height will decrease by one half. If uh, you delete two horizontal ones, I think it increases by one half. When you slide, then uh, there is also an increase or decrease of one half. And when you decide to create vertical horizontal, here is the only randomness, the height decreases or increases by one half. Okay, so these are simple rules you can check once uh, you accept the definition of height function and, and, and of the dynamics. Do the neighbors stay the same? <laughs> yeah, so it's yes. You yeah. The 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 move we do only at the at the at the even faces. So in, in each time step, the height at the odd faces stays the same, or only the even faces evolve. And then the next step, this one becomes odd. So the, this this is the reason why I want to swap from even to odd. Otherwise, I would just flipping up up and down this high, this number, and then there would be, be nothing interesting. Okay, so this is time t, and this is time t plus one, and then you go. So I could have defined the, the height function, the, the, the height evolution simply in terms of height, but I think it would, it would look even more unnatural. So in terms of these dimers, it's, it looks more simple. Anyway, so we have a height uh, time, uh, stochastically, 
evolving high, discrete high profile. And we would like. How does it uh, compare to the boiler in Ferrari? Uh, but this one is this one is, is the same. Yeah, this, this is the ball in ferrite dynamics. So the uh, the suffering and the positive. Um, well, I think you can also in that case introduce certain interlaced particle systems, and uh, you have. Uh, I it might uh, I think it, so you know in the ball in ferrite paper they have a section where they, they they introduce a much more general class of dynamics. Some of them in parallel, some of them in continuous time. I think the shuffling also fits in, in there. Uh, I think so. Uh, okay, so ah, uh, now um, the, the, so we might ask why would we look at these two models? What do they have in common? What do they have in common? So, and what is so different from the, the, the original uh, dynamics where particles flip up and down? So the common feature of these two processes, and processes I mean the Gordon Ferrari dynamic and this Shaft Gregory, is that uh, one can exhibit very explicitly uh, stationary states for the gradients that we call PO as before. There are um, translation invariant stationary states. Okay, so it's not, it's not just a question of existence, but they are really explicit and uh, a certain a certain um, uh, gives or DLR type, uh, satisfies certain DLR type conditions. So let, let me explain uh, what this means. <coughs> Maybe in the, in the next lecture I will convince you that, uh, at least in one case, that these, these measures are really uh, stationary. Okay. So what, what is how are these uh, what are the features of this um, of this measures p rho? <coughs> so rho they are, they are indexed by the slope. Okay, the slope is the average slope, and uh, and there will be translation invariant. So these are measures on the perfect matchings of the whole lattice. It can be Z two or the hexagonal lattice. Okay, before I tell you how these are characterized, let me tell you what, what I'm talking It's like in, like in the classic uh, particle system, the slope is between minus one and one, because uh, you have, have at most uh, one particle per side. So also here, the slope cannot be anything. So what you can see, for instance, when you, when you are on Z2, you can see easily that uh, uh, when I move one step, and here one step means actually moving two phases because I want to be back to a phase with the same parity. Okay? So when I move from phase F to a phase one step away in direction one, so F plus U1, so U1 is uh, this elemental step, you can check that the high difference uh, is between uh, one and one, and minus one and one, so this is deterministic state. The, the height from here to here can change at most by, by one, and this between like these two things. Same thing uh, vertically. And actually, macroscopically, one can see, it's not hard to convince oneself, that the slopes of this uh, on Z2, the slope, the allowed slope for the interface are belong to a square uh, of uh, the center of the zero. Oh, sorry, it doesn't look so much square. Uh, the square of uh, okay, whose vertices are minus one z or one z or and so on. Okay, this is something one can check. This is a determinist kind of deterministic state. Similarly, there are constraints on the slope in the, in the case of the, of the hexagonal lattice. What you can see is that, uh, for instance, you remember you have, we have this time picture, okay, and then uh, etc. For instance, you might, you might consider a height function where uh, when you we associate to a, to a vertex of each uh, rhombus the height with respect to the horizontal plane, something like this. And then you can check that the, uh, the, the slope fault here be, 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 um, belongs to a certain triangle which has uh, vertices 0, 0, minus 1, 0, 0, minus 1. Okay, anyway, so, so 
It's simply because you are in the discrete, the, 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 the slopes cannot take any value, they are restricted to some sets, and then according to the lattice, you find a, a square a thing, but generally you find some other convex polygons. Okay, so this is a simply a, This was simply to say that we will have, for every slope which belongs to the, to the loud set, there will be a measure. Of course, if you try to impose a slope that is outside, there is just no configuration. So Okay, so this was simply about the allowed uh, uh, values of the slope. So how are these invariant measures characterized? Well, uh, they are translation invariant and ergodic. Ergodic with respect to translations. Uh, well, of course, they have a, an average slope Wrong. So it means that if I look at the average with respect to this measure of h of a certain phase f translated by EI, EI is a translation, so it's elementary translation in direction one or two, like in for the uh, for the square lattice is this or this, for the triangular lattice. And imagine minus h of f, this is simply of i. This means that uh, you have average slope from I equal to one. Okay, so this up, up to now there is not much, but uh, the really important thing, which is very special for this, uh, for the stationary states of these two processes, is that these measures satisfy so-called version, uh, version of the so-called DLR, DLR or the Russian Lamford Duel equations which in, uh, in this case are a very simple way to say, so there is no equation, there will just be just a picture. The, 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 the point is that, uh, suppose I take these measures, uh, so they, they live on the perfect matches. So suppose I take uh, lambda is a finite, uh, uh, is a finite subset of my lambda, say Z2, suppose I'm in Z2. So if you want, is a finite subset of the edges of Z2. And then I condition, I take this measure, I condition on the configuration, let's say we call it M, or maybe eta, I call it, outside of, of C, of lambda. So <coughs> lambda is the set of edges in this square box, uh, 4 by 4. And then I condition on the value of the matching outside. Maybe it's like, I don't know, maybe this is inside. Maybe this, uh, I don't know. OK? I condition on, on the configuration outside of this box. This is lambda C, and this is and then the claim is that, well, the property of this measure satisfies is that this measure here, so condition on this, is simply uniform over all, say, matchings uh, eta, tilde, well, okay, let's call it eta tilde, all matchings eta, such that they coincide with eta tilde outside. They are, they are, it's uniform over all matchings that are compatible with the boundary condition. Yeah. In a sense, these measures are locally uniform. If you condition on the outside of any set, inside you are uniform. But, uh, okay. but uh, and, uh, so once you condition on the outside, the parameter rho does not enter the measure. The parameter rho enters because uh, the typical condition you put outside depends on rho. Okay. So the statement here is that. Uh, Okay, there are various statements hidden in the blackboard. First of all is that, uh, okay, let me say, tell them all right, uh, because uh, I forgot the time. Uh, I forgot really. Five plus four. Okay. Uh, there are various uh, statements I'm not really giving as theorems, but one can prove, for instance, that for every row, for every slope that is inside this set, actually it needs to be stuck inside. Such measures exist and actually it's unique for every row. And uh, uh, not surprisingly, you can, you can obtain it as, uh, in the following way. You take, uh, you take your graph, you periodize on the torus, so n by n torus, okay, this is easy to do. And you take the uniform measure condition on having a height change around the torus to be L times rho. Okay. So of course, on the torus, the height function is not well defined because uh, but you can, uh, you can simply take all the, uh, you take the n by n torus, you take all the diameter configurations such that if you apply blindly 
the, the rule for, the, for <coughs> determining the, the height function change when you do a tour around, around the cycle, around the top in direction one or two, you find L times row one, L times row two. You take the configuration that are such, take the uniform measure, let the torus size go to infinity, you get these measures here. The limit exists, and it's unique. Okay, so the, the, the thing is that these measures do exist, and they're actually unique for a given so. And then there are other um, very nice properties like determinant of structure that maybe I will mention later. No, I don't want to overload this. this. Okay, but uh, the, the, the very special thing, uh, sorry, sorry, the, the claim is that, and I will do the proof for one for the body of the right dynamic, is that these measures here are uh, invariant for the, the, the session and for the dynamic. Actually, maybe I can let's see what comes next. I can go. Uh, okay, maybe if I make these comments and then, uh, then maybe I can uh, convince you that this is true. Okay, so these comments are the following. Uh, uh, so these, these measures are very special, are kind of uh, uh, a kind of deep, deep style. So uh, if you want, if you want, I, in terms of height, suppose I, suppose I, um, I fix the height of all, my, all, 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 all the all the lattice, uh, all the spaces, except for a single one. Okay, for instance, so I, I fix the height in, in the whole lattice, and I would like to see the, the how the what is the law of the um, how is distributed the height in the, in the in the phase where I've not specified the height. So a consequence of this characterization is that under these measures, the height here just depends on its four neighbors because uh, <coughs> the the allowed values for the height you can put just depends locally on the, on the configuration. So these measures, uh, these measures here are very are very special in the sense that they have very local uh, very local uh, dependence on the neighbors. If you if you look at the, the distribution in some set, knowing the outside, it actually depends only on what is uh, your your height function near the boundary. And in general, this is not a generic fact you should expect for uh, for for. Uh, for uh, non out of equilibrium evolution. Okay, so uh, for instance, uh, if you take the single flip dynamics where uh, you can do just this update with rate p and one minus p, I have no idea what the stationary states look like, but certainly I don't expect that uh, it's kind of keeps measure with uh, depending on the with potential that it's short. Right? Okay, the second, uh, the second uh, point is that these measures are stationary, but they are not reversible. This is, should be really obvious, but uh, let me stress it. Uh, okay, this I've said. Uh, I said that these measures also have very nice features of having a determinant structure. That is, okay, maybe later I will say something, but... Uh, so you see, what, what is the analog of these measures in 1D? So in 1D you have TASET, the invariant measure are Bernoulli. Okay, so every, the occupation variable at every side is independent of the occupation variable at every other side. Here, <coughs> we don't have uh, these, these measures here on, on, on dimer configuration are not high Simply, this is simple to, uh, to understand, because if you impose that a certain edge is occupied by a dimer, this clearly imposes some constraints on the neighbors. You, can, you cannot put the the dimers IAB on the, on the lattice, you will certainly have superposition, you will have holes and so on. So clearly they are not, these measures are far from being IAB, and uh, so it can be looked very hard, but there is a determinant structure that means that if you want to compute the probabilities of the type, uh, I have a dimer here and a dimer there, then you have just to compute the two by two determinant. If I want to impose a dimer here, a dimer there, and in K positions, you have a K by K by determinant to compute. This is very special. Okay, maybe I will probably have some, some kind of formula later. Uh, any questions? Or maybe here I will be. Yeah. This is kind of a main question, but I do understand that when these models scale to the Gaussian pre field, these properties will definitely be satisfied because you have a Markovian field. I mean, you also have a harmonic crystal. Yeah. And that's where this property is coming from. But uh, why, the, why are these also satisfied in the, in the level of the discrete model? You know, one expects that, I mean, if I take yeah, the yeah. scaling limit, yes, I mean, if I'm getting Gaussian free field, that's Markovian field, you know, this so, will be started. But what is a little bit, I mean, to me at least surprising is that one is also getting 
the Marconian property there in the in the level of the maybe C1. one. Okay, so you, you maybe I think let's see if I interpret well the question. You, we might imagine models that, that are in this universality class, so on large scale which we should see Gaussian free field, but maybe on microscopic. Yeah. Now, the, I think the answer is that for more, there might be certainly, I guess there exist such models, but uh, <coughs> the models we are able to, to, to treat, uh, we are able to treat because this property is already true at microscopic level. So it's not, it's not, an ex uh, thing, uh, it's not something I would expect <coughs> in the whole class, but uh, if we don't have this property, then uh, we, we don't have examples. Okay. Okay. So it's a height function, like yeah. Okay. Yeah. Height function. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, maybe. Let, let me. Let, yeah. Let me uh, mention. Yeah. Maybe this is a good point. So this. Uh, this measures here. Uh, if you take this transition invariant, these mm, this measures for uh, mm, uh, diamond coverings, it's known that the height function scales for Gaussian free field. So uh, let me write down a statement. This is something that uh, okay, has been understood for several years now especially thanks to the works of Kenyon and, and uh, workers. Um, for instance, you can do the following. Uh, sample the matching theta from this P row, for any of these rows. And then to each eta, you associate the height function that depends on the, on the phase. And then if you, if you, take, uh, if you take a test function phi, uh, it's a, let's say a smooth test function in zone R2 with, uh, with uh, you better take it to be over than zero. Uh, and you take the following thing, uh, maybe, uh, okay. you sum, you, you scale out the, you smooth, you scale out the, okay. you understand? Uh, I should take a sum over all the faces x, faces, the height function times phi of epsilon x, and I multiply by epsilon squared, and this converges under under this uh, this law here, as epsilon goes to zero, to a Gaussian uh, to a Gaussian uh, center Gaussian field. Uh, okay, I have to subtract the uh, of covariance. Uh, let me call it sigma square phi, and sigma square phi is simply uh, dx dy. Phi of x on R2 times R2. Phi x, phi y times the covariance, uh, let's say g of x, y. And for x and y close, g of x, y is essentially uh, minus 1 over, I think, 2 pi squared. I forgot the constant if it's like this. Log of, of, the, of, the, of the x minus y. So you see, this, in a sense, this height function converges to a Gaussian field with log, with log correlates and the Gaussian field. So the Gaussian field, field with the precise constant that might be this one or maybe twice or like this. Okay, this is something that is known. Okay, on large scales, with these measures, these measures look like Gaussian free field. In particular, the roughness, the roughness exponent is alpha is zero in the logarithmic law of uh, correlation. Of, uh, Okay, so this was my answer to the question. And uh, let's see, uh, on my uh, So maybe <coughs> one. Uh, okay, yeah, so uh, I would like to emphasize no reversibility. So, one might think that, well, for, for, the, for the process which where particles jump only up and never down, it's obvious you have no reversibility. Uh, for this process here, maybe it's less obvious because you see, when I do the creations, I create two guys, horizontal or vertical, with the same probability. It looks very symmetric. But uh, one can check that the dynamics is non reversible. So it's very normal. Even, even if the slope is, if the, even if the average slope is zero, if the average slope is zero, it looks very symmetric. In fact, it will have a, a growth velocity which is zero, but the process is not reversible. But the dynamics, I mean, it's okay, okay, it's not reversible, but if I wanted to run the dynamic backward, so can I describe this model with the backward generator? Like in some way? 
I mean, know. even KPZ is not reversible, but I mean, it's simple. Yeah, but also does it, you can just reverse it. Exactly. Well, you yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a, I think if you initially you swap the colors or something like this, you okay. can go back. But, uh, but uh, something like this. So, yeah, in the same sense as does it, you can reverse it if you right, change exactly. the. Yeah, there is something similar. Okay, so this one is important to remark that this, this, this uh, thing are not reversed. And uh, okay, once, I'm, once more, I would like to emphasize this: the fact that you can find out uh, explicitly the stationary states is, is really special. So one is using one D from Tazet and so on to have Bernoulli type of uh, stationary state, even if we are non reversible But uh, it's a special feature, so it's not it's not something you should expect in general. So if you are non reversible dynamics, so. Finding the, 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 the station I measure in general, no one wants to. Okay, so maybe uh, the, I can, in the 10 minutes, I would like to just uh, simply to show why uh, this is really a, something very simple I can do on the deck, but it doesn't require, require essentially any computation to show why for this body Ferrari dynamics, these this measures are, 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 are invalid. And there you will see why it is important that I allow all jumps and not a uh, single single. Uh, so this I can do on the blackboard. Uh, so I will be kind of sketch, but I would just like to, to show the idea. The idea is very simple, but it, it works because the model has been something special. All right, so, uh, so invariant of P rho. As I said, if you really want to prove that these stationary measures are invariant, the, there, are, there are technical problems because uh, the dynamic is not obviously well defined for every initial condition. You might have very long jumps and stuff like this. But I will actually only show how it works on the torus. On the torus, there is no problem. You are in a finite state space. Uh, uh, there is no issue of the existence of the force on the torus. Uh, so let's say that we take. Uh, okay. I will not try to draw the torus, but uh, you have these particles here, each one associated to one line, to one column. Etc. And then somehow you have periodized the system both in horizontal and vertical direction. So it's what L by L. And uh, suppose I take the, the uniform measure. The uniform measure on all interlaced configurations of the towers. I would have to impose also the slope, but it, for the sake of this argument, that's not. So I just take the uniform measure on this particle configuration on, on the L by L torus, and I call it PL. Okay, and then start, uh, from, starting from here, I, I, I start my dynamics. Particles jump up with rate, uh, for simplicity, let's say they jump up with rate one and down with rate zero. So it's totally asymmetric. The argument is, is essentially identical in the general case. So they can jump up with rate one and never jump down. I would like to see that this is invalid. Stationary state is in the, 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 the major is invalid. So I would like to do this, it takes a few lines and a couple of pictures more. And then I would like to show you why it's not invariant when you just allow jumps by one. Okay, so what do I have to do? I have just to take this measure, apply the generator, and uh, hopefully it's zero. All right, so, so let me just uh, define one, uh, one couple of uh, notations. So given eta, even if eta is a configuration, <coughs> let, me call, uh, let me call omega eta, is this, okay, let's give a name to the configuration space, uniform on omega. Omega is the set of all possible uh, configurations. So omega eta is the, are the eta prime in omega that uh, that you can reach from eta with a single jump upwards. The reach that can be reached 
sweep, and the up jump. Okay, so for instance, uh, uh, this new configuration is, is belongs to eta omega eta, but the one where, okay, so there are certain which are reachable with a single jump and certain that are not. Altogether, the thing is, uh, is uh, okay, is it clear? Is this a set, of, a set of configuration where I can go with a single jump. And, uh, and analogous in omega minus one eta are the eta primes in omega from which you can reach eta with a jump. From which Very nice. So clearly, uh, obviously, since the range of jumps are just one, uh, P, ah, okay, so L, okay, so L sigma prime sigma, yeah, I, I think I will not use the slides anymore for the idea of five minutes. So. L sigma sigma prime. If sigma is different from sigma pi, it's just one. And L sigma sigma uh, is just uh, the, the sum of the thing on the rows has to give one. So L sigma sigma is just minus the number of configuration. Oh, I'm sorry. Now I've switched from eta to sigma. OK. Sigma equal eta. <laughs> <laughs> so the, 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 the diagonal matrix element of the generator is just minus the number of places where I can jump to. Simply because it has, uh, the rows has to sum to zero, and then okay. Now we want to check if uh, P L P times so if I gener apply generator to P, what happens? Well, P L uh, L computed at some uh, theta. Well, let's say sigma because in my notes I have sigma. Well, of course it's simply the sum of sigma <laughs> prime of P L uh, sigma prime. Uh, L uh, sigma prime sigma. Now we have the uniform measure. So we just want to check whether this is zero or not. Of course, this is constant, so you can drop it. It's just one over the number of configurations. Okay, so uh, so this is, I mean, I want to check this. And this is simply, well, the, you have, well, what is this? This is uh, the number of configurations from which I can go to sigma minus the number of configurations for me to which I can go from C. I'm simply using the... Uh, okay, I guess the summation restricts only... Phi is not really constant, is it? It's really constant. Um, yeah, here I'm taking Phi to be the, the uniform measure of the whole possible configuration. And you could... Uh, if you really want to converge the large scale limit to the thing of slope pro, you have to take uniform over those of slope pro. But again, it's uniform, and it's, it's, uh, it's uh, the dynamics preserve the, 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 that subspace. So, so the argument is it's just the same. Your W is it's uniform condition. If you condition on the boundaries, so see here, I'm just I'm taking PL, which is really the, the uniform measure on uh, on uh, on interlaced particle configuration. I might also restrict to the sort of the height change in the two direction. It would be the same after. Ah, ah, ah uh, yeah, yeah. If you take the uniform measure and don't constrain anything, you converge uh, in the limit where P rho for a particular rho, this is, this is one with the maximal length. If you want to find other rows, you have to condition on the slope. But if you want, it could be. P rho could be the uniform measure on the particle configuration such that the height change is rho 1 and rho 2. But the argument is the same because if you start from a sigma in that space, sigma prime also are in that space, so, so anyway, the argument is very same. Okay, so I'm almost essentially done because, okay, so I would like to see that for every configuration this thing has to be the same, so if it's true it must be a very simple other st statement. Uh, Okay, in fact, it's, uh, it's on the terms, it's really easy to see. And the idea, so, okay, so the idea is the following. Um, the idea is the following. Okay, maybe I go back to the, so the idea, so it is sufficient. So suppose I can show, suppose I can show that this guy here, this thing here is independent on sigma. I would like to see it's zero for every sigma, suppose I, it's a constant, then it is zero. 
because uh, once you sum over sigma, it has to be easy. So if so, follows if uh, if this thing here does not depend on so let's call it star star of sigma, if star of sigma is constant. Okay, so, and this is now easy to check because we have just to check that for any <coughs> configuration that can reach be an elementary move, this, this, uh, this, uh, this, this stuff is constant. Let me make a picture. Suppose I have two configurations. In one, you have a particle here, then maybe the neighbors are here, uh, maybe here, uh, maybe here, here, and so on. And uh, this is one configuration, and the second configuration is simply differs from the other one because this single particle has been moved up, say, one up one step. Okay, so before I do the, I do the picture, let me let me comment on what these things are. So, wh where can you go from sigma? Well, for every particle, you have a certain amount of places you are available. Let for for a particle, so p is a particle. In configuration sigma, let me associate, uh, I don't know, uh, let me call it i plus of p, p sigma, is the number of positions that are available ab above. So for instance, maybe, maybe this one has just one position, maybe this one has a lot. Okay? And similarly, i minus of, of, of p, p sigma, p is not p in the rate, it's p is a particle, is the number, is the number of position, it can, it could go down without uh, interfering. Of course, it will not go down, the other and just count it. Okay, then clearly, what is, what is I, uh, what is sigma, or, uh, what is this thing? So this stuff here is simply the sum of the whole particles P of I minus of P, the number of places for which I can count, and this is the sum over P of I plus. This is simply counting how many places you can go, how many places you can come. And now I would like simply to prove that uh, once you move particle by one, this all these things might change. Well, some of these things change, but the sum, the sum is, stays the same. Okay, let me do it a bit quickly. So suppose uh, I move this particle from here to here. So it's clear that from this particle here, its I plus will decrease by one because I'm moving up. And the, and the i minus is, is increasing by one for the same reason. So, okay. <laughs> so the i plus I said has decreased, so I get the delta is v sum after the move minus the sum before the move. So I get a plus one because the i plus of this particular particle decreases, the plus one because the i minus of the same particle increases, but then also the neighbors have. Uh, the, the difference. So say, now, for instance, this particle here, its I minus is not changed because it doesn't look uh, up, but its I plus increases by one, so, uh, and then you get a minus one. This particle here doesn't see anything because, anyway, it, it is screened by this other guy. So this one doesn't contribute, and then you can see that uh, I don't know, this, uh, this one also contributes plus or minus one. So you have really like two, it's really a local check, and uh, okay. So you have to, I leave you to repeat the thing, and uh, okay. But uh, yeah. if I had this, yes. But then this is conditional on the number of particles you have, right? You have to do. Yeah, yeah, but uh, the <coughs> I could split the so the, the dynamics on the whole state space is not irreducible because. The number of particles is conserved, and there are two conservation laws. But if you, and anyway, the, all these sectors are uh, in, inside the, the dynamics preserve the number of particles. So you can mm, uh, split the dynamics on, on this reducible uh, subspaces, and then do the same. It's essentially the same question as you were asking. So not only the number of particles is conserved, there is another thing that is conserved, but, it's, but you can do it for only every subspace. And so let me just conclude by saying the following. Suppose I had considered my initial dynamics where particles jump by one only. And I want to show that uh, this, this uh, PL is, will not be zero. This is very simple to see. Suppose all particles, if all particles are well spaced, meaning that everyone can move up or down, 
then, uh, okay, what, what changes here is that <coughs> instead of having omega sigma being the sum of the i pluses, you have just to say it's the number of particles that can move up. And there, this one is the same number of particles that can move down. So if all particles are free to move up and down, clearly one sum is n, the other one is n, you get zero. But then you can uh, easily take such configurations where these three particles have this condition. This one has an uh, up thing, which is 1, and these two have down, which is 1, and they, they don't compensate. So you can e very easily construct configuration that show that uh, this, uh, the uniform measure is not preserved. Uh, so it's, uh, these long jumps really cures this, uh, this issue, and, uh, but it's very special. It's not like I have a large class of rates and I've just given you one example to be simple. I mean, it's really, we have like two examples where it works, and it's very special. Yeah. And, uh, okay, I won't have time, so I will uh, stop here. And tomorrow, let me just tell you what comes. I will start stating a few theorems about these two discrete uh, of More, more questions or comments? Is it easy to explain the uniqueness? Uniqueness of what? The invariant measure to this particular case. Um, it is one line. Uh, no, no. Uh, uh, well, no, on the, on the torus, it's obvious. Once, once you have imposed the, the slope, on the torus, the, the length is irreducible there. So once you fix the slope, you have a unique thing that is unique, that is uh, that is uniform, and when you let the torus go to feet, you converge to this measure. The uniqueness, uh, but you could say there are other that might you, maybe you might not be able to get from the torus. Uh, it's a theory of shape. It follows from a general, more general form, and it's why. No, it's not something I can do. I think it relies on uh, some couplings, it's what the idea plus uh, strict convexity of no, it's not something that is solved. Actually, the, the uniqueness space on for the slopes which are on the boundary of the region. You can easily exhibit various uh, things that have the same slope, but they really have to be on the boundary of this. More questions?